Ever drive in San Diego and notice that I-15 went from I-15 to California 15? Or from I-295 to DC-295? Or perhaps you spent time in the New York area and noticed that it's New Jersey 495 heading into Manhattan rather than I-495 to meet the Long Island Expressway? Well, you're not alone. These are what I call the almost interstates. Highways that are intended to be, or were intended to be, a part of the interstate highway system, but for one reason or another, they are signed as state routes. On this video, we'll be taking a look at some of these highways across the country and exploring how they came to be, and when, if ever, they will be added to the interstate highway system and finally get that coveted blue and red shield. Welcome to the channel. I'm Mileage Mike, a civil engineer who used to design the world for a living. Now I'm traveling it. Bring you a look at various American cities and infrastructure as well as discussing them with videos like this one. Hit the like button for the algorithm and subscribe if you really love it because this is going to be a long one as we get into talking about these almost interstates. With this video, we're going to start on the West Coast and head east, and that means starting in one of my favorite states, California. Specifically, down in my favorite city, San Diego, the best weather in all of America. In San Diego, we have not one, but two almost interstate highways, California 15 and California 905. California 15 picks up where I-15 officially ends at Interstate 8. It continues south for around six miles to meet its end at I-5 near downtown. Along the way, California 15 has an interesting interchange with I-805 where a driver can only continue in the same direction. For example, if you're traveling north on California 15, you can only exit onto I-805 north, or if traveling southbound, you can only exit onto I-805 south. Though a freeway, the issue preventing California 15 from getting that coveted red and blue shield are interstate standards. It looks like Google Maps jumped the gun and labels it as I-15 despite it still being signed as California 15. I don't see any information from Caltrans about upgrading California 15 anytime in the coming decades, so it looks like California 15 will be here for a long time to come. As for California 905, from what I can find, it appears that this highway is up to interstate standards, but something with the way it was funded prevents it from being currently added to the system. Based on Caltrans plans, it will also be a state route for the foreseeable future. Heading a little further north to the nation's second largest city, the land of freeways itself, Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, there are two almost interstates, California 710 and California 210. California 710 is a short stub at the interchange with I-210, the Foothills Freeway, and California 134, the Ventura Freeway. It is intended to connect to I-710, the Long Beach Freeway, to the south. Caltrans has made several attempts with many different proposals, even a proposed tunnel to get these roads connected. But at the end of the day, it looks like the towns in the path of the freeway, particularly the city of South Pasadena, have decided that they do not want the freeway built. So it appears that this section of I-710 will be another in the graveyard of canceled Los Angeles area freeways. California 710 will never connect to I-710, so don't be surprised if California decommissions this route in the future. Enjoy your traffic jams, LA. Now, California 210 is the name that I-210 takes on to the east of its interchange with California 57, the Orange Freeway. It is also known as the Foothills Freeway by locals. California 210 continues east past its interchange to San Bernardino and loops back around to the parent route, I-10. Currently, California 210 is not signed as I-210 due to not meeting interstate standards. Looking at the 2020 State Transportation Improvement Plan from Caltrans, the only mention of 210 appears to be lane additions to the I-210 section near the western end of the loop, with no mention of improvements to the California 210 segment. So I won't say never with California 210, I just say not anytime soon. Next we will head over to Nevada, to none other than Las Vegas. In my younger days, stationed out at the Marine Corps' most exciting base in 29 Palms, California, I spent many a weekend driving through the desert and hanging out in this city. The almost interstate in this area is not even a state route, but a county route. That is County Route 215 on the west side of the city. County Route 215 forms the western side of the Las Vegas Beltway that connects to I-215 at a major interchange with I-15 just south of the Strip. So the first thing you might be asking is, why is this a county route rather than a state route? Well, upon further researching, it appears that County Route 215 was constructed by Clark County 
rather than the state of Nevada. Clark County is the large county that contains Las Vegas and its surrounding suburbs. This is the first time in U.S. history where a county has planned and built its own interstate highway. Currently, County Route 215 is not I-215 due to not meeting interstate standards. It is a mix of various segments of freeway and expressway. The expressway segments were built in the interim to get the entire railway constructed with freeway upgrades to come later. Clark County is currently in the process of upgrading these segments to interstate standards and once completed, the highway will be turned over to the Nevada DOT and finally get that coveted blue shield and join the rest of I-215 to complete the Las Vegas Beltway. Continuing a little further east, we reach the Mile High City Denver, Colorado. In Denver, the almost interstate in question is Colorado 470, another beltway. Colorado 470 was conceived back in the 1960s and was originally planned to be a full beltway around Denver to be named I-470. It was added to the Federal Highway Act of 1968, with the federal government providing 90% of the funding. However, the proposed beltway faced significant pushback on environmental grounds and was eventually canceled. The federal funds were then used to build a partial parkway along the southwestern part of the metro and widening existing surface roadways. The southwestern portion was eventually upgraded to freeway due to the rapid growth in the area and it mostly conforms to interstate standards. People in the area later expressed desire for the full beltway around the metro, but at this point, Colorado DOT refused to build it and left it up to the local cities and counties. Eventually, a plan was developed and the beltway was constructed east of I-70 and later extended to I-25 north of the city. This section is referred to as E-470. These new sections were built as tollways in order to pay for the project. Later, the city and county of Broomfield built a new section from I-25 to US-36, known as the Northwest Parkway. And finally, to complete the last link in the Beltway, the Colorado DOT, in compromise with suburban cities along the proposed route, agreed to build a W-470 tollway to connect back to the other end of the roadway. However, this was later rejected and canceled. One final attempt was again made to be called the Jefferson Parkway, but cities along the proposed route backed out, citing concerns about excavation in the area, as it was formerly the site of a nuclear weapons manufacturing plant. Other concerns included noise, air quality, and debris that could fly into nearby yards from traffic on the highway. While the Jefferson Parkway site was last updated in October 2020, there is no indication that this project has been reactivated nor planned to be constructed. So when will Colorado 470 join the interstate highway system? The answer is not in this lifetime. While completing the Beltway will have no bearing on whether or not the existing roadway can become an interstate highway, it will be almost 100 years before the roadway could be eligible to join the system. Recall that the Northwest Parkway was also built as a toll road. Now look at this routing. To no surprise, this stub does not see enough traffic to generate significant toll revenue. The Turnpike Authority in Broomfield that built this section was facing a default on the loan and turned to Portuguese company Brisa to bail them out. This included a 99-year lease for $603 million and a non-compete clause which forbids building roadways that may compete with the tollway for drivers. Brisa actually flexed on Broomfield and invoked the clause when the city attempted to improve 106th Avenue. All of this was in hopes that the road would eventually be extended to I-70 in Jefferson County, which as of now does not appear to be likely. This means that unless they can cough up over $900 million to buy out the company, the Northwest Parkway will remain as is until 2106. So there will be no blue shield for Colorado 470. Moving along, we arrive in the St. Louis area on the Illinois side where we have Illinois 255. Illinois 255 is an extension of I-255, which bypasses St. Louis to the east. Illinois 255 was built to interstate standards in 2012 by the Illinois Department of Transportation using public funds. From what I could find, it appears that Illinois 255 is fully an interstate quality freeway all the way through but Illinois may not be interested in signing it as I-255 due to its ending not being at another interstate and spur routes leading with odd numbers rather than even numbers, which then begs the question of why it wasn't signed with an odd number originally if this was the reasoning. Illinois 255 looks like it will remain a state route for quite a while. Illinois is a repeat offender with Illinois 394 in the Chicago area. Illinois 394 travels southbound from a modified cloverleaf interchange with I-80, I-94, and I-294 in South Holland. From here, it continues south until meeting its end at Illinois 1 south of Crete. Illinois 394 is an interstate quality freeway north of an intersection with Salt Trail until the northern terminus at the interchange with I-80, I-94, I-294. However, at this intersection, and the remainder of the route south of it, 
Illinois 394 is a major arterial surface route. As recently as the 2010s, Illinois 394 was not only rumored to be upgraded to a full interstate, but to also be extended past its southern terminus to an interchange with I-57, which would have made it a full loop around the suburbs in this area. As of now, there are no plans nor intentions to spend the money to do this, so I think it's safe to say that Illinois 394 will remain an almost interstate. But hang on guys, we are not done yet in Illinois. We have yet another almost interstate in the Chicago land area. This one is Illinois 390 near the O'Hare Airport, and not only is it an almost interstate, it doesn't even connect back to its parent route. Illinois just said we do whatever we want. Illinois 390 is a fully electronic toll road known as the Elgin O'Hare Tollway. It travels from US 20 and Hanover Park through an interchange with I-290 and meets its end just outside the O'Hare Airport at Illinois 83. An extension of Illinois 390 is currently under construction to extend it eastward to the edge of the airport and meet the proposed I-490 tollway which is also under construction. Some of the construction of these routes is visible via Google satellite imagery. I-490 will be a western bypass of the O'Hare Airport and serve as the route which Illinois 390 will have access to parent route I-90. Once these two roads are constructed, it can be assumed that Illinois 390 will be eligible to become I-390 and acquire its blue shield, should Illinois care to apply for the designation. Illinois 390 appears to be the only Illinois route that has a realistic chance at joining the interstate highway system in the near future. Now we will take a trip down south to Arkansas. The road that we'll be exploring here is one that is somewhat related to the future I-69 corridor through the state as discussed on this video. It is Arkansas 530. Arkansas 530 is currently a two-lane partial freeway expressway from I-530 and Pine Bluff southward to Arkansas 11. This style of two-lane partial freeway includes clear right-of-way for future expansion to add the other two lanes and interchanges later once more funding is acquired. It appears to be Arkansas's way of getting corridors built to achieve partial benefits of the roadway with limited funding. Eventually, Arkansas 530 is to be extended to meet future I-69 in Monticello and is part of a larger corridor to be added to I-530 stretching from I-30 in Little Rock with the overall goal of having a full interstate connection between I-30 and I-69. Once these upgrades are done and the roadway completed, it will be signed as I-530 and added to the interstate highway system, with I-30 running a distance that rivals some mainline interstate highways. As to when these upgrades will be completed, well, don't expect it any time in the foreseeable future. Arkansas is also trying to build out the remainder of I-49 and to a lesser extent, I-69 in the state. So the full interstate version of Arkansas 530 may not be seen in this lifetime. However, I wouldn't be surprised if they do end up getting the two-lane version of Arkansas 530 built out in the next decade or so. So with Arkansas 530, it is likely to remain an almost interstate for the time being. Continuing around the South, we arrive in South Carolina. In South Carolina it is the almost interstate highway, South Carolina 277, in the state capital of Columbia. As the number shows, it was intended to serve as an auxiliary route to the parent I-77. South Carolina 277 was planned shortly after I-77 was approved to be extended from Charlotte to Columbia. It was designed to parallel the existing congested Farrell Road surface street. It currently exists as an interstate quality freeway for the most part and was planned to continue to an interchange with I-126 near downtown, cross the Congaree River on a new bridge and loop back to the main line I-77 near Casey, hence the even digit numbering for the highway. For whatever reason, the route passed the current terminus was canceled and there does not appear to be any plan to go back to the original proposal. With it actually being up to interstate standards, it appears that if they desired, South Carolina could renumber the roadway to something like I-177 and add it to the interstate highway system. But since it's been like this for over 40 years now, it's safe to assume South Carolina has no intention of giving it a blue shield and it would remain an almost interstate. Now, if this were in North Carolina, you already know they would have applied to have this spur added to the interstate highway system with the quickness. Which brings us to our next state, North Carolina. Though it started off with a paltry, bare bones, original interstate highway plan, North Carolina in recent decades has not been one to be shy about building and turning nearly every four lane road in the state into an interstate or close to it. If you're familiar with the state, then you already know what our almost interstate is here, North Carolina 540 in the Raleigh and Durham Research Triangle area. Raleigh already has an inner beltway known as I-440, but with all the explosive growth in the area, North Carolina decided that an outer beltway was needed. Though proposed to be a full beltway, North Carolina signed the route as I-540 as a placeholder number to be re-signed as possible I-640 once the full beltway was completed. However, later it was decided that the roadway could not be completed in a reasonable time frame with traditional public funds. 
and instead tolls could be used to finish the beltway more quickly. Tolls are a recent phenomenon in North Carolina, so there was significant pushback to that idea, but eventually it was done, and North Carolina 540 was constructed as a toll road named the Western Wake and Southern Wake Expressway. Since it is expected to eventually be added to the system, it was built as a full interstate quality roadway. Future plans call for the Southern Beltway to be completed as well as a new, unique, and massive interchange with I-40 near Garner and eventually connect back to the current I-540 terminus in Nightdale. The right-of-way has already been acquired and parts of the roadway are already under construction. Bidding on the contract to build the final portion opens up in 2029, so it is reasonable that we can expect to see a completed I-540 sometime in the 2030s, at which point the question is, will North Carolina let the 540 number remain, which is uncharacteristic for a beltway, or will it be changed to I-640? We shall see. Another almost interstate in North Carolina is North Carolina 74 in Winston-Salem. Currently, NC-74 is the temporary highway assigned to the Winston-Salem Northern Beltway. This is a future beltway that will wrap around the city of Winston-Salem as shown on the map. Upon completion of the beltway, the route is expected to be renamed I-74, while the western segment is to be renumbered Auxiliary Route I-274. According to the NCDOT, the final phase of the beltway is to begin construction in 2029, so we could be looking at a future X-74 route sometime in the early to mid-2030s. North Carolina is on it, two for two. Both almost interstates here look like they will soon acquire their blue shields. Heading north to the Commonwealth of Virginia, you already know where we're going, Richmond. And the highway in question here is one of the most underused and overpriced toll facilities in America. Virginia 895, the Pocahontas Parkway. As the number indicates, Virginia 895 was intended to be signed as I-895 at their parent route, I-95. Virginia 895 forms the southeastern loop around Richmond, connecting I-95 with I-295. Due to a series of complicated events, Richmond never got its full beltway like many other southern cities. The end result is Virginia 895. I-295, and a few other disconnected partial loops. The Federal Highway Administration rejected Virginia DOT's request for the I-895 designation on this roadway due to it being built partially with federal funds and told interstates cannot be built with federal funding. The road cost around $324 million to build, and $9.28 million of federal funding was used in its preliminary engineering, thus preventing the 895 designation. Many have traveled along I-95, but few have traveled on this road. One thing of note from I-95 is the extremely high bridge crossing towering over the roadway as you approach Richmond. This was done to keep the James River navigable for shipping vessels in the area. Also of note is that there is no ramp to access the roadway from southbound I-95. Since construction, the roadway has been plagued with problems. Australian company Transurban acquired the roadway in 2006 with a 99-year lease for $611 million and flirted with bankruptcy, eventually walking away from the roadway and selling it off to a Pennsylvania-based firm. Even today, the roadway is known for its very high toll costs and relatively light usage, though it is said that as of 2014, it does make enough to cover its maintenance costs. I drove this route on the channel a couple months back, and it was a good place to drive and have the road all to yourself for a price, of course. So unless Virginia DLT plans on sending $9.28 back to the feds, Virginia 895 shall remain an almost interstate. Continuing up the East Coast, we head to the nation's capital, the DMV. Here we have DC 295 and Maryland 295. The continuation of I-295. DC-295 continues north from where I-295 ends in the Anacostia neighborhood as the Anacostia Freeway until it reaches the Maryland state line, then continuing north as Maryland 201 and unsigned Maryland 295. It is unique in being the only non-interstate highway inside the district. In Maryland, after a junction with US-50, it continues north, unsigned as 295, the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, until reaching its end in downtown Baltimore. It's quite obvious why this roadway does not have an interstate designation. It's a freeway, but not even close to meeting interstate standards. D.C. nor Maryland have any intention of rebuilding this road. Maryland doesn't even sign it, so it is definitely remaining an almost interstate. Moving along to Pennsylvania, we arrive in the capital city of Harrisburg. In Harrisburg, a series of freeways looping around the city are known and signed as the Capital Beltway. Pennsylvania 581, a potential auxiliary route of I-81 is assigned to the southwestern portion of this loop. It is a freeway for its entire length from I-81 to the interchange with I-83. I drove this route back in September. From what I can tell, it appears to not be up to interstate standards in some parts, particularly the very tight, small median. It does not appear that Pennsylvania has any intentions to bring this highway up to interstate standards, so it will remain an almost interstate. Still in Harrisburg, we have an I-83-related almost interstate, Pennsylvania 283. 
Pennsylvania 283 actually intersects with the existing Interstate 283 in Harrisburg, but functions like a stem off of that railway rather than an extension. It connects Harrisburg to Lancaster and is a freeway for pretty much its entire length. With Pennsylvania 283 and I-283 being two separate roadways, it will not be changed to I-283 in the future. It ends at Eisenhower Boulevard, while I-283 connects to I-76, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Last but certainly not least is a state that I've been becoming quite familiar with as of late, and the biggest serial offender on our list today, the king of almost interstates, New York. In New York, we have not one, not two, but seven almost interstates. Those are New York 495, New York 390, 590, 787, 890, 481, and New York 895. Let's get it started with the big fish, New York City. That brings us to the most egregious example at the heart of Midtown Manhattan, New York 495. New York 495, as its name suggests, was originally intended to cross Midtown Manhattan and connect to I-495, the Long Island Expressway. Its story is linked with New Jersey 495, which has an interchange with parent I-95 and crosses into New York via the Lincoln Tunnel. The New Jersey segment was actually originally granted the I-495 signage. However, the Mid-Manhattan Expressway that would have connected the two segments and provided a direct link between New Jersey and Long Island was canceled in 1970, and I-495 was downgraded to New Jersey and New York 495 in 1978. The Mid-Manhattan Expressway was one of Robert Moses' more bizarre concepts that involved many proposed designs, the most ridiculous of which was building the roadway through the Empire State Building. He pushed for an expressway while the city government preferred a tunnel alternative which ultimately led to his cancellation. It's a shame they couldn't get the tunnel option done. Today's New York City traffic flow could look much different and much better. Still in New York City, we have another very interesting and unique roadway in New York 895. New York 895 is unique in the fact that it actually was a part of the interstate highway system. Fully signed, completed, kind of, and in operation. The roadway was originally signed as I-695 and then to I-895, and for a short time, I-278 was routed onto the roadway before being moved to the Bruckner Expressway. I-895 existed here, where the current New York 895 sits, and there was a proposed extension northeast to connect to I-95 in Eastchester, but was canceled due to public opposition. This left I-895 as a short stub route with limited utility. New York State DOT studied ways to improve safety on the roadway as well as improving its usefulness to traffic flow in the area. Proposals included expanding capacity on the roadway and extending it south to Hunts Point. Environmental justice groups from the community opposed these ideas and instead proposed the expressway be demolished, claiming that it isolated Hunts Point from the rest of the Bronx. While New York State DOT claimed that demolition of the expressway would force traffic onto local streets and have a negative impact on traffic flow. The expressway was carrying over a 50,000 vehicles per day at the time. New York City Mayor of the time, Michael Bloomberg, announced his opposition to removing the expressway, and in 2017, Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the solution to the expressway would be a conversion to a boulevard. At a cost of $1.8 billion, the expressway was demolished and converted into a boulevard. The removal of the I-895 designation was approved by AASHTO and the Federal Highway Administration, and we have today the unique story of an interstate highway that was downgraded to an almost interstate, New York 895. My personal opinion is that the route should be given a unique state numbering since it will not be re-added to the interstate highway system, but one could assume that they used the 895 number for familiarity purposes. Our next stop is in the capital region near Albany where we have New York 787. New York 787 is a northern extension of Interstate 787 in the area. Interstate 787 currently ends at a cloverleaf interchange with New York 7. It continues as a freeway but quickly becomes a standard four-lane divided highway with grade crossings at the I-787 terminus. Some may call this configuration an expressway due to the concrete barrier and limited number of driveways and crossings. New York 787 was originally built in the 1970s as part of I-787 that ended at Art Street, but was extended by the 1990s to the current terminus at New York 32, and was then signed as New York 787, with the I-787 designation ending at New York 7. New York appears to have no plans to upgrade this highway to interstate standards, so New York 787 will remain an almost interstate. Slightly further west, we have New York 890. New York 890 is a short, one-mile freeway extension of I-890 crossing the Mohawk River, ended at New York 5. While the right-of-way for New York 890 was acquired and cleared back during I-890's original construction, New York State DOT ultimately canceled the project due to lack of funding in 1976. In a rare case of a council freeway being revived, in 1983, a new $1.25 billion bond called Rebuild New York was approved 
and new studies to complete New York 890 were started. In 1986, the project was estimated to cost $20 million to complete, but due to several delays, it had ballooned to $52 million by 1995. Work finally began in 1996 and was completed by October 1998, and New York 890 was signed. Though New York 890 uses the numbering of I-890, it appears that it was always intended to be an extension of I-890 across the Mohawk River, rather than actually being signed as part of that route. The actual I-890 loops back to parent route, I-90 after a toll booth and trumpet interchange to complete the full loop, while New York 890 is like a northeastern branch of that highway. Moving on to the Syracuse area, there's New York 481. New York 481 is a northern extension of I-481, which loops around the eastern side of Syracuse. New York 481 actually continues as a four-lane controlled access freeway for a long distance up to the city limits of Fulton. After Fulton, it is mostly a four-lane divided highway with grade crossings and drops down to two lanes in some spots before its ending in Oswego. Clearly, the portion of this route at the Fulton city limits and beyond will never become an interstate, but the part between there and the interchange with I-81 is a freeway. However, it could be assumed that New York doesn't care to extend the I-481 designation past this interchange. It would also change I-481 from a loop with junctions at its parent route on both ends to having this sort of loop and stem to the north. It does appear to be a pattern here in New York liking to use almost interstates as extensions of interstate routes, but doesn't intend to actually add them to the interstate system itself. Up next, we arrive in Rochester, New York to check on New York 390 and New York 590. These are also extensions of the interstate version of those routes in the area. New York 590 continues north where I-590 currently ends at the interchange with I-490 to the east of the city. New York 590 in this area is also known as the Sea Breeze Expressway, and for most of its length, it is a full controlled access freeway. The name is derived from the neighborhood that the route used to end at on Lake Ontario. The current northern terminus is at a roundabout intersection with Titus Avenue in Irondequois. The highway was originally constructed between the 1950s and 1960s and formerly carried the New York 47 designation. It was redesignated as New York 590 in 1980 and the original route truncated to end at Titus Avenue in the 2000s. In the late 1970s, New York actually submitted a proposal for what was then New York 47 to be eliminated with the freeway portion to become part of I-590. However, in 1980, when the New York 47 designation was eliminated, I-590 was stopped at the interchange with I-490. So while it appears that the highway is interstate quality, New York has no plans to request for it to be added to the interstate highway system again. On the western side of Rochester is New York 390. Like New York 590, New York 390 appears to also be a full interstate quality limited access highway, where it extends north from where I-390 ends at the interchange with I-490. It was also constructed in the 1960s and 70s and given the New York 47 designation along with now New York 590. It appears that New York 47 was formerly a partial loop around Rochester with the east and west sides being freeways. Similar to New York 590, it was also requested to become I-390 to replace New York 47, but instead was given a New York 390 designation while I-390 ended at the interchange with I-490. Like New York 590, there are no plans to request for New York 390 to be added to the interstate highway system. And like its sibling, New York 590, it shall remain an almost interstate. All right, guys, that wraps it up. The almost interstate highways across the nation. Have you been on any of these highways? Which ones do you think have a good chance of actually getting that coveted blue shield in our lifetimes? Do you think the state should even bother adding them to the interstate highway system and just leave them as state routes? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you on the next trip coming soon to a town near you.